Hello, I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and welcome to Coronavirus in Context. Today, we're going to talk about whether or not we're managing coronavirus correctly, and do we need to think about a change in our treatment regimens. And my guest is Dr. Cameron Kyle Seidel. He's a physician trained in emergency medicine and critical care, and he practices at Mamamides in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Dr. Seidel. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, thank you for inviting me. So you've been talking a lot about the number of patients, the percentage of patients actually, that are dying on ventilators. When did you first notice this trend? Um, you know, so in preparation of opening, uh, uh, what was you know going to be what became a, a full uh, COVID positive intensive care units. Um, you know, we kind of scoured the data just to see what what was out there, and obviously. Um, you know, those that have experienced it before us, uh, primarily the, you know, the Chinese and the Italians, um, you know, it, it was hard to find exactly, you know, what the uh, rate of, you know, what we call successful extubation, meaning someone was put on a ventilator and, and taken off. And, and that data is still hard to find. And I imagine there's a lot of people still on ventilators. Um, but, but from the data we have available, it, it appears to be uh, you know, somewhere between uh, 50 and 90%. And it seems that most uh, reports or most uh, published data, you know, puts it around 70%. So, you know, that's a, that's a very, very high uh, percentage in, in general when one thinks of a, of a medical disease. And you've been talking on social media. Um, you say you see things that you've never seen before. What are some of those things that you're seeing? Um, you know, so when I initially started treating patients, you know, I was under the impression, uh, as most people were, that, that I was going to be treating acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, that, uh, you know, was similar in some sense to the, you know, ARDS that I, I saw as a fellow. Um, and as I started to treat these patients, I did. I witnessed things that, that are just unusual. And I'm sure doctors around the country are experiencing this. Um, you know, it's not, uh, uh, in the past, we don't see patients that are uh, talking in full sentence, sentences and, and not uh, complaining of overt shortness of breath with saturations in the high 70s. It's just not something we typically see. Um, you know, when we're intubating some of these patients, that is to say when we're putting a breathing tube in, they tend to uh, drop their saturations uh, uh, very quickly. And, and we see saturations going down to 20 to 30. Uh, and typically one would expect some kind of um, uh, reflexive uh, uh, response from the heart rate. Um, which is to say, usually we see tachycardia, and if patients go too low, then we see bradycardia. And these are things that, you know, we just weren't seeing. You know, I, I've seen literally a saturation of zero on a monitor, mm -hmm. which is not something we ever want and something we actually actively uh, uh, try to avoid. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, we saw, saw it, and, and many of my colleagues have similarly have seen, you know, saturations of 10 and 20. And, and you know, our whole practice is aimed when we try to put breathing tubes in is to avoid this very situation. Now, uh, these patients tend to desaturate extremely quickly. Um, and so these, uh, these situations have occurred. Uh, and still, you know, what we're seeing that there was no um, change in the heart rate is just unusual. It's just something that we are not used to. Um, you know, so that's suggesting that this is more like a high altitude thickness. Is that right? Rather um, than a viral so that we're talking Yeah. So, so what I was trying to find, you know, the patients in front of me are unlike any patients I've ever seen. And I've seen, you know, a great many number of patients and I've treated many diseases and, and you get used to seeing certain patterns and just the patterns I was seeing did not make sense. Now this, you know, originally came to be when we had a patient who had hit what we called our trigger to put in a breathing tube meaning she had displayed a level of hypoxemia, of low oxygen levels, um, where we thought she would need a breathing tube. And most of the times when patients hit that level of hypoxemia, they are in distress and they can barely talk and they can't say complete sentences. And she could do all of those and she did not want a breathing tube. And so she asked that we put it in at the last minute possible. And it was this um, perplexing clinical condition, when I was supposed to put the breathing tube in, when was the last minute possible? And all the instincts as a physician, 
uh, you know, all, we're looking to see if she, you know, so-called tires out, if she's getting too tired. None of those things occurred. And it, it's extremely perplexing, but it just, I came to realize that this condition is nothing I've ever seen before. And so I started to try to read um, and try to figure out what, uh, and leaving aside the, the, um, the exact mechanism for how this disease is causing havoc on the body, but just trying to figure out what the clinical syndrome uh, looked like. You talked a little bit about the data from Italy and yeah. Badanoni. Were, were you aware of what was going on in Italy before you noted these observations, or did that come after the fact? So that came a little bit after, and I wasn't aware. Um, you know, I can't even remember the exact timeline, but in my reading, I, I sort of came upon decompression pulmonary sickness, which is you know, they essentially the bends when divers dive and come up too quick, which seem to have some um, kind of a, a mirror picture clinically as these patients. And then, you know, in discussions with other people, it came up that, you know, they do similarly uh, appear clinically. And this is not to say that the pathophysiology underlying it is similar, but clinically they have, they look a lot more like high altitude sickness than, than do pneumonia. Um, and Gattinoni, uh, you know, he published something on March 20th, which was about two days uh, before I opened the ICU. And I don't know that I read it then, um, but, but uh, somehow it got passed around. And, 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 you know, in my mind, by the time I read what he was saying, um, I'd come under the impression that this just wasn't the usual ARDS that, that we were used to seeing. It was a high compliance disease, which every pulmonologist and anyone managing a ventilator can see. That's not a question. And so then when I read his stuff, where he's suggesting that uh, the management strategy that we use is, is essentially somewhat flipped, um, at least in these high compliant patients, it just became more clear that, that uh, you know, if we operate under a paradigm uh, whereby we are treating ARDS in these high compliant patients, um, we may be not uh, operating under the right paradigm. Um, which is they, how have you changed your protocols then? Um, so to be honest, the, you know, I've run into a, a great deal of um, resistance uh, within my institution, which is not to say that anyone is, is, is trying to stymie progress at all. It, it, these are the protocols that are, uh, um, you know, in every major hospital and minor hospital. I mean, the, you know, we generally... Uh, you talked about in your videos yeah. against longstanding dogma um so what's been the response from from your clinical colleagues as well as hospital administrators so to be honest in the icu i i i started to try to um you know run not my own protocols but to to treat patients as i would have treated my family under um uh, with a different goals which is to say a ventilation um however these didn't uh fit the protocol and, and you know, the protocol is what the hospital runs on, what the respiratory therapists, what the nurses. I mean, you know, everyone is part of the team. And so actually we ran into an impasse where, I, you know, I could not, um, I could not morally in a, in a patient doctor relationship, I could not continue um, the current protocols, which again are the protocols of the top hospitals in the country. Um, but I could not continue those. And obviously they couldn't have someone, you can't have one doctor um, uh, just doing their own protocol. So I actually had to, to step down from my position in the ICU. And so now I'm back in the ER um, where we are um, setting up uh, slightly different ventilation strategies, but, but fortunately we've been boosted by recent work by Gattinoni, which actually was formally published today, which does outline um, uh, not the best evidence-based and at least expert recommendations for changes in, in uh, what were our, our overall protocols. Quick, quickly, can you tell us what are some of those changes that you're going to make? Uh, first, I'll describe sort of what Gattinoni is saying, which is that really uh, what we're seeing in, in ARDS are, are two different phenotypes. Mm -hmm. um, one in which the lungs display what you call high compliance, low elastance, um, and one in which they have low elastance and high compliance. And so really what that is, you know, to say simply for people who are not, you know, uh, pulmonologist is that if you think of the lungs as a balloon, um, typically when people have ARDS or pneumonia, uh, the balloon gets thicker. 
And you, so not only do you lack oxygen, but uh, the pressure and the work to blow up the balloon uh, becomes more. And so one's respiratory muscles become tired as they struggle to, uh, uh, to breathe. And, and so patients need pressure. What Gadnoni is saying is that there's two different, uh, essentially, phenotypes. One, in that sense, where the balloon is thicker, uh, which is uh, a, a low compliance disease. But in the beginning, they display high compliance, which is to say that imagine if the balloon is not actually thicker, but thinner. Mm -hmm. um, and really, so they suffer from a lack of oxygen, but it is not that they suffer from uh, too much work to blow up the balloon. So, you know, as far as how we're going to switch is we're going to take our approach uh, 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 differently from the traditional ARDSnet um, protocol in that we are going to do an oxygen first strategy, which say we're going to leave the oxygen levels as high as possible, and we're going to try to use the lowest pressures possible um, uh, uh, to try to, uh, keep the oxygen levels high. And, um, you know, so that's the approach we're going to do so long as the patients continue to display the physiology of a low elastin's high compliance disease. Do you feel that somewhere the world made a wrong turn in treating COVID-19? I don't know that they made a wrong, I mean, it came so fast, you know, I think that one thing we benefit from is that the Chinese and the Italians were hit first and they were hit hard. And I cannot imagine, I mean, really New York is being hit so hard. It's hard to, um, it's hard to switch tracks when the train is going, you know, a million miles an hour. And I think in that sense, we benefit uh, from their shared experience. And I think it's important that we, um, you know, we listen to that experience, but I do think that, that, um, it, it starts out with uh, knowing or at least um, accepting the idea that this may be an entirely new disease. Because once you do that, uh, then you can accept the idea that perhaps all the studies on ARDS in the 2000s and 2010s, which were large, randomized, well-performed, well-funded studies, that perhaps none of those patients in those studies had COVID-19 or something resembling it. And so it allows you to move away from a paradigm in which this disease may fit. And unfortunately, you kind of have to walk somewhat into the unknown. I think you're advocating something a little different. So what are the consequences of you being wrong? Albeit well-intentioned, what if you're wrong? You know, at this point, I would say, you know, uh, I, I, um, I mean, you know, right now we have some of the greatest experts in the world giving their, um, uh, their, their, their opinions now, you know, by that, I mean the Italians and Dr. Gadnoni, which is suggesting this. So, you know, I really, you know, I certainly could be wrong. And really what more I'm asking for is not even, um, not even an immediate change in the ventilation strategy. Because, you know, I am not, uh, I'm critical care trained, I'm not pulmonary trained, and, and I'm not ex as experienced as, you know, many around the country and many in my own hospital. But what I would like to see is all these great minds get together. And if they can accept this notion um, that perhaps we need to switch paradigms um, and, and they're, they're able to better uh, create a path forward that fits the disease, I would gladly follow them. And so, really, what I'm asking and what I'm requesting is um, that all the experts of the field, you know, get together and, and perhaps come up with some fresh recommendations. Now, you've been active on social media, as I mentioned. Are you a whistleblower? I don't, you know, I've never, this is sort of my first foray into social media. I don't know that I'm a whistleblower because I don't know that anyone, um, anyone was trying to uh, purposely do any harm. I think that, you know, all the physicians involved and all the nurses and everyone writing protocols, you know, everyone I believe is, um, is working as fast and as hard as they can with utter good faith and pure intention. You know, I think that uh, for me, I saw something clinically that didn't make sense. And, and seeing that New York is about 10 days ahead of the country, you know, I just felt compelled um, to get that information out. Has speaking up impacted your professional career? 
I mean, I don't know yet. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, in one sense, I feel um, I have not felt qualms about it. Uh, you know, I, uh, for whatever reason, you know, I trained in critical care and I was an ER doctor, you know, and I think part of that allowed me to see it a little bit better because if you just receive these patients in the ICU on breathing tubes, it's very hard to, to, to see this physiology. And, you know, I was running around the hospital from the ER to the floors to the ICU, and I saw them in all stages of this disease. And, and I think part of it is when you see them in all those different stages, you're able to see that something physiologically uh, doesn't make sense. And, and so in a way, I do feel that uh, somehow, you know, somehow my training and my position, you know, and being in New York City, you know, allowed me to see this. And so I have not felt any um, conflict uh, about um, coming forward per se. And, and I don't know what it will do for my career, you know, but uh, I hope that, uh, you know, people know that I'm not doing this with any kind of, uh, um, you know, I'm not trying to stymie anything or, or to, you know, it's really, mm-hmm. you know, I'm doing what I think is right. What are the two things that we need to be doing right now in your mind to really kind of address the mortality? You know, uh, well, that's a good, to go back to your question of, of, uh, yeah, if I am wrong, you know, doctors right now, and these are my colleagues, we are desperate now in the sense that everything we are doing does not seem to be working. Um, So we've reached a point that most other, in other diseases, we have not reached where uh, many physicians are willing to try anything that may help because so little seems to be helping. As far as what we can do, um, you know, one of the reasons I hope to speak up and I hope people at the bedside speak up is that I I think that there is, there may be a disconnect between those who are seeing these patients um, directly, who are sensing that something is not quite right, um, and and those uh, brilliant people and researchers and administrators that are um, writing the protocols and, and, and working on finding answers. Um, and so I think that, you know, if the first thing to do is if we can admit this is something new, I think it all starts from there. And I think that we have the kind of scientific technology and the human uh, capital in this country to, to solve this, um, uh, or at least have a very good shot at it. So that's, you know, the first. And I think the second thing is, is that, uh, whatever collaboration we can do with those who came before us, and by that, the Chinese and the Italians and, and the Egyptians and whoever else has experienced this, anything we can learn from them, you know, I think we need to, to open up and, and be ready to receive their help. Well, Dr. Kyle Seidel, I want to thank you for speaking up and sharing your story with us. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate you allowing me to speak. I know I want to thank you for watching Coronavirus in Context. I'm Dr. John White.